Good morning. Y'all, please stand with us this morning, and we're going to see, sing Ancient of Days. Y'all join us. We did sing this about a month ago, so join with us as we sing this morning and worship together. of days from every nation all of creation bow before the ancient of days every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you will be exalted O God and your kingdom shall not church family. Uh, in just a minute, we are going to continue reading 1 John. We will read uh, verses 1 through 14 of 1 John chapter 2. Before we do that, though, I have a couple of announcements. Um, June 27th, that's a Sunday. Uh, we will not have our Sunday night service here. We will meet at Liberty First instead for the LMA uh, Fourth of July Freedom Service. So be aware of that. We're not going to meet here on the 27th. Uh, the next day, the 28th, uh, we've been given the opportunity to come have um, a service day, uh, a missions day um, at this camp that a couple's trying to get started over in uh, Townville. They're trying to put together a camp that'll be a family camp with uh, Christian values where families can come or like uh, youth groups can come and, and hang out and learn more about God. Um, they've asked if, if we could come and do some painting, cleaning, yard work, that kind of thing. Uh, first off, this was just going to be a, um, an opportunity for the youth, but we decided why not open that up to anybody who would be interested. Um, so if you would be interested in that, see me. Um, I'll probably have a sign-up sheet that you could look at um, by Wednesday. Um, let's see. Today at 4.30, we have the nominating committee. Uh, they will meet, again, that's today at 4.30. Um, on the 4th of July, we have a lunch fellowship. After the service, we'll get together and just uh, spend time, have lunch together, play some games, um, just as a church family, 
uh, we'll all get together and do that. Is that something that people need to sign up for? Or is it? Okay. We don't need to sign up for that. It's just something we're having. So plan on hanging around after the service that day. Um, last thing, after the service today, there will be a brief Bible school meeting. So if you're serving in Bible school, uh, hang around in here after the service. Uh, Jessica's going to lead a meeting again right after the service. All right, let's get into our scripture reading. Again, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. This is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him, and yet doesn't keep his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old command that you have had from the beginning. The old command is the word you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light, but hates his brother or sister, is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and doesn't know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, since your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you have come to know the one who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have conquered the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you have come to know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have come to know the one who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. God's word remains in you, and you have conquered the evil one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come worship this morning. Um, we're thankful that we live somewhere where that is something we can do. Uh, God, as we enter this time of worship, uh, I pray that... Um, Whatever it is, any distractions that we may have, that we would set those aside, that our hearts would be focused on you, that we would be prepared to hear the message that you've given Pastor Josh. Um, God, thank you for everything you do for us. Uh, thank you um, for Jesus. Thank you that our sins could be forgiven, and thank you that we could have a relationship with you. God, as we um, go on from this time of worship, I pray that that's something we wouldn't take for granted, that we would see the relationship that you've allowed us to have with you, that we would make that everything it's supposed to be, and that we would live every day and every moment of every day in relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you to stand with us again as we sing hymn number 67, Praise Him, Praise Him. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will go. 
Father, as we continue to praise you, we just thank you for the beautiful day you've given us to come to your house, as every day we're able to come to your house, it's beautiful. Father, we just ask that you be with especially our visitors today. Father, just uh, uh, have us greet them and make them welcome and know that they uh, have a home here at East Side. Father, we ask you to continue to be with the ones that can't be here because of sickness. And we just uh, thank you for all of the ones that taught this morning. We had a great Sunday school. We just bless your name for that. So we come to this time in the service. Lord, we just ask you to be with the gift and the giver in Christ's name. Amen.
God's Word this morning, and turn with me to the epistle of Paul written to the Romans. For the next month or so, we're going to be looking at the eighth chapter of the book of Romans in a series entitled, Justified. The very important and critical doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. With all the issues that faced the 16th century Reformation, Martin Luther said this was the doctrine. This was the thing that we are justified, not by works, justified. Not by the law, justified, not by our deeds, but justified by our faith in Christ alone. So this morning as we consider Romans chapter 8, I want to illustrate it by telling you a story. In the year of 1987, an unknown Dr. Ben Carson was the leading neurosurgeon of a team of 70 surgeons at John Hopkins Children's Center. And he would lead a surgery that would be a groundbreaking surgery. It would be a surgery of the first of its kind. It would be a very risky surgery, and he would either be famous or he would either be destroyed in the medical field. In Germany, two twins were born, co-joined together, their heads back to back. And so Dr. Carson would have to go in with his team He would have to cut the vein, separate the two babies' heads. For weeks, his team took two baby dolls, velcroed, co-joined their heads together, and practiced this surgery. This family in Germany was completely and absolutely dependent on the surgeon. There was nothing that they could do in their thought process. There was nothing that they could do in their power. There was nothing that they could do by sheer will. It had to be a surgery that had to be performed, and all of their trust and all of their faith had to be in this surgery that it would go Well, that's not to minimize that God would have to work and that uh, God would have to move in that situation, but understand, humanly speaking, all of their trust was in the surgeon, was in this surgical team that would be able to perform this surgery. The surgery came, and it was a complete success. 
And as we think about such a, such a surgery, we come to the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And just as that family, and just as those twins were at the mercy of the surgeon, just as there was nothing they could do, just as there was nothing in their power to be freed, the surgeon had to separate the two babies. We are born into a sin nature. We are born into a vile nature against God. And in that vile nature, the only way for us to be separated from the guilt, the condemnation, and the penalty and wrath of sin was for the work of Christ on the cross to be perfected and for us to place our faith in Jesus Christ and the atoning work of Christ. So as we think and as we look at Romans chapter 8 and justification by faith alone, understand not by any good thing you've done or I've done, not by any deed, not by reading your Bible enough, not by praying enough, but solely trusting in the work of Jesus, understand you're not condemned but you are free in his grace. Look with me at Romans chapter 8. We will only read the first 11 verses this morning. And as we just heard the, the song in the video, the title of the message is In Christ Alone. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law. It's okay to amen when that's being read. Of sin and death. For what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, as a sin offering, in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot Please God. Now notice this clause here in verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through His Spirit who lives in you. Let us pray this morning. Dear most precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you encouraged in our hearts 
for what we've heard by way of song this morning. And Lord, as we look at such a powerful and such an important doctrine as that is justification by faith alone in your Son, Jesus alone, Lord, I pray that you would just speak through your word today. And I pray, Lord, that if there is anybody here that is struggling with coming to Christ, struggling and saying, well, he would never accept me. I'm too much of a sinner. My life is too ugly. He would never want a person like me. Would we leave today edified? Would we leave today knowing that there is no condemnation when we come to Jesus? That it's Jesus that saves and it's that Jesus that purifies us and makes us holy for God. Lord, I pray that you would move during this brief time. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. We are starting in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, halfway into such a masterpiece of doctrine. And so it's necessary for me to give you the context this morning. There is one theme, there is one idea, there is one argument, there is one case that Paul has been driving to from Romans chapter 3 verse 21 through Romans chapter 8, the chapter we're going to spend time in for the next month or so. That one theme, that one idea, that one argument, that one thing that he wants to say and he wants to get his point across is that in Christ We have had our lives impacted by the gospel that we have been reconciled to God through Christ. Do you notice the language there? Do you notice how Paul is not just focused on this idea of, well, look, if you just want to go to heaven one day, just just pray this simple little prayer here and you're going to have your ticket punched. Do you notice how he doesn't focus solely on eternal life? But he focuses on what the purpose of the gospel truly is. That we sinful humanity would be reconciled to a relationship with God through Jesus and the gospel. With the great benefit. With the great eternal inheritance. That yes, that is true. One day we're going uh, to spend eternity with God without the problem of sin getting in the way. But the point is that we are reconciled to holy God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through his death, burial, and resurrection when we place our faith in him reconciled to God. Don't look at me like that. This is exciting stuff. Get into it. Own it. Be excited this morning. Because we have such an exciting Savior and such an exciting news to tell that we are justified in Christ Jesus. Paul here hits the divine initiative. The divine accomplishment and the divine salvation for all believers. This really is an amazing chapter. If you were to look at it in its original language, if you were to look at it in the Greek New Testament, you would discover that it is five paragraphs pregnant with meaning. It's full. It's ready to explode. And what's really interesting about this chapter is, from verse 1 to verse 39, the two pieces of most important information is found in verse 1 and verse 39. In the first verse and in the last verse. Think about it for a moment. In the first verse, 
The Apostle Paul hits his audience, hits his readers, hits us, hits the Jews with this truth. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen to me this morning where you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what the previous sin is. It doesn't matter what your life has looked like in the past. When you come to Christ, when you believe on Christ, when you place your full trust in Christ alone, you find yourself in a justification that leaves you pure before God because God is not looking at you. He is looking at the record and reputation and sinlessness of the Savior. Amen? That's what we mean when we say justification by faith alone in Christ alone. The, the slate has been wiped clean. Understand that this morning. But then... In verse 39, what do you see? Oh, Paul gives all kinds of possibilities that the Jews would have come up with, that the people would have said, but what about this, but what about this, but what about this? Not height, nor depth, nor any created thing, nor any sin, nor anything can separate you, can separate me, can separate believers from the love of God, which is in who? Christ Jesus, our Lord. What a truth. What an amazing thing. Listen, I can't mess it up. And you can't mess it up. I went to Staples a few years ago. And I got a bookshelf that you literally cannot mess up. It says it on the instructions. You can't mess this up. I want to tell you, if you go in to my garage and you look at that bookshelf I put together, it's messed up. I messed it up. One board is completely smooth and looks great. The other board is turned the other way and it's rough. I have one right and one backwards. The instruction said you can't mess it up, yet I found a way to mess it up. The world said the Titanic was the unsinkable ship. What happened to that unsinkable ship? It sunk because man crafted it and man put it together and lives were lost because of that. But isn't it comforting to come to the text and to know that there's nothing you can do to mess it up? There's nothing you can do to lose it. There's nothing you can do to make the wrong choice, to commit the wrong sin. And God says, I've had it with you. You're done. You're out. It's over. No. When we've been born of God, when we've come to Christ, there's nothing you can do and there's nothing I can do to mess up what God has done in Christ Jesus. What an amazing, encouraging truth for us this morning. You know, a few years ago, I met a man and shared the gospel with him. And he said to me, Pastor, he said, where I am right now in my life, who I am before God right now, Jesus wouldn't want me. Jesus wouldn't accept me. I'm not somebody that Jesus died for. Jesus would want no part of me. Then he said this. He said, I need to get through the hurdles. I need to get to a place. I need my life to be clean enough for Jesus. And I looked at that dear man, and I said, the problem with that philosophy, the problem with that ideology, the problem with that situation is, on your own, you can't jump the hurdles. On your own, you can't get clean enough. On your own, you can't do it. You need Jesus to clean your life. You need Jesus and his finished work on the cross in your life to regenerate you to the condition you're talking about. We can't do it. If we could do it, we wouldn't need Jesus. And Paul said, 
If that's the case, he died needlessly. He died for no point if we could clean our own lives up and we could live perfectly before God. Then we wouldn't have justification by faith alone in Christ alone. We'd have justification by works. And that's not what the Bible teaches. And that's not the reality of the situation that we are in. When we look at verse 1 through verse 9, we see that we are justified We are freed from the nature of sin in such a way where we would uh, commit repetitive, unrepentive, lawlessly sinning due to the work of Christ and the power of the Spirit. Now look just briefly at verse 1 in chapter 8. He says, therefore, and as I have already Explain to you that just takes us back from 321 to chapter 8, the context. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Now stop there. There is now. That refers to the resurrection of Christ. Paul is saying to the Jews, He is saying to his audience, he is saying to you, that because of the death, because of the burial signifying his death, because of the resurrection, when we place our faith in Christ, Paul says now, as of now, right now, the moment we believe on Christ, we are no longer condemned by sin. Sin is no longer something that God looks upon and he's disgusted by because what he sees is Christ in us. What he sees is Jesus. What he sees not is our sinful record, but what he sees is how we've been purified by Christ and by his atonement. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see what Paul is doing is contrasting because if you take the word condemnation it would refer to one that is a slave to sin. It would refer to one that is dominated by sin. It is referring to one that is unrepentive. It is referring to one that doesn't see the need to repent. It is seeing The person that at one time was a slave, controlled, dominated, and sin was their master. And what he's saying is, once the Holy Spirit of God works in your life, once you are drawn to Christ, once you are drawn to repentance, and once you trust Jesus with your life, there is no more condemning. There is no more condemnation. There is no more of that. You're not condemned any longer. The moment you believe on Christ, that condemnation ends. But will you look at verse 2 this morning in the text? You see, this is such an amazing passage, and it has such a relational structure. What I mean by that is, the Apostle Paul builds his case. He makes his claim, and then he gives a ground for his claim. So his claim has been, those who are in Christ Jesus, now there's no condemnation. So look at verse 2. Because, here's the ground, because the law of the Spirit of life In Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What does he mean by the law of the Spirit? What does he mean by this? If you go back to verse 2 again and you see that he uses the the terminology, the law of Of the spirit of life. This is Paul referring to the authority and to the power 
of the Holy Spirit of God who has taken sinful man, who has taken condemned man, and as they have trusted on Christ, He has moved him away from that state, and he has moved him to a state of regeneration. You see, the truth is that the old man was unrepentant. The old man was embedded in sin. The old man loved his sin. The old man loved his deeds. The old man never saw a need to repent. The old man could justify his sin. And we see it all the time in the world today, do we not? We see sin rampant. We see sin unrepented. And we see sin that is constantly justified. Well, I sin, but I do it because of this reason. Well, yeah, I'm in this situation, but it's because of that reason. Well, yeah, that's true, but it's because of this over here. Where instead, the one who is condemned no longer in Christ Jesus, they know they're in sin. They know what's going on. And they repent over that. There is something in them that causes them to repent. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ leads them and draws them to live a repentive life before God. And remember, as I said Wednesday night, that's not a saying I'm sorry. That's not just walking a church aisle. That's turning from that sin, and that is turning away from that sin. If we are in Christ, it's not saying over and over and over again, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's turning away from the nature of of sin. Paul is not suggesting you will never sin again. He's not suggesting that you won't have moments where you sin. He is simply saying in that unrepentive, repetitive lifestyle of sin, that comes to an end when we come into a relationship with Christ. And when we sin, we get our spiritual knuckles hit. <laughs> When we sin, the Holy Spirit of God brings conviction into our life, causes us to repent of that sin. That's what we're looking at. That's what happens in this this nature. In verse 2 again, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has what? Set you free. Free from the law of sin and death. Unrepented, repetitive sin leads to death, leads to hell, because it leads to a life that doesn't know Christ. It's not that a person committed that one sin. It's not that that one sin is going to send you to hell. No, no, no. That's not what it is. What it is is evidence that a person has never truly been born again. Like Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Like Jesus said to the religious leaders, you must be born again or you'll never see the kingdom of God. He is talking about sin and he is talking about How the Spirit of God, through His power and through His authority, regenerates that person. That that person could live obedient lives in Christ. Let's stop for just a moment. Think about this for a second. Have you ever thought the evidence of a saved person is a changed life? Right? How do they live that changed life? They don't live it just because they will it to happen. (laughs) They don't live it just because they want it to happen. They don't live it by just sitting and meditating. They don't live it by just removing themselves from society. They can only truly live that when salvation has occurred in them and the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life is now dominating them, is now controlling them. Why do you think Paul said in Galatians, walk by the Spirit? Because when we come to Christ, 
We are leaving the life of worldliness, of that sin. And we are not being controlled by sin and dominated by sin. We are now being controlled and dominated by the Spirit of God. A sobering, liberating truth. Well, look at verse 3 through the first part of verse 9. Because we come to a very interesting thing here. Paul does another contrast. He is contrasting in verse 3 through the first part of verse 9 the law in itself. Because you have to remember, he is writing with his audience at this point to the Jews. He's addressed Gentiles in this letter, but he's also addressing Jews in this letter. He's had the benefit of being a Jew, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knows how they think. He knows what they're going to say. He knows their argumentation. He knows how they're going to try to justify themselves. And he knows what and how they're probably going to respond because he would be thinking about the way he would have responded as a Pharisee. So what he does is he contrasts what he's just said with the idea of, I'm justified by keeping the law. And you see, what Paul really does here, which is so masterful, is he makes it clear that you can't be justified by the law because the law was never given to show man how good he could be. It was given to show man how good he could never be. How far he really fell from the perfect standard. And even in today's culture, I hear people say, well, I'm just going to live by the Ten Commandments. Really? How's that working out for you? You've probably broken three of them before breakfast. Oh, I'm just going to live by the code of morality. Really? Again, how's that working out for you? Oh, I'm just going to try to live a good life. I even hear some say, I'm going to live by what I've heard is the fair exchange approach. You ever heard this? People do it all the time. Honestly, they do. Well, I know I've done three bad things over here. And they're bad. They really are. But you know what? I did seven good things over here. So the good over here will outweigh the bad over here. And that's their whole system of being right with God, of being morally right even in society. They don't believe in God. But again, what Paul is doing is showing that you're not justified by the law. You're not justified by deeds. You're not justified by good works. You're not justified by any of those things. You're justified by faith alone. Had a guy reach out to me on Facebook, wanted to learn the methodology and the discipline of what we call text-driven preaching, and he's a, he's a Church of Christ guy. And so part of his system is that you believe on Christ, you repent of sin, and through baptism, water baptism, you are saved. He said to me early on, I don't really want to talk about doctrine, I don't want to argue about doctrine, I just want to learn these things. And I thought to myself, well, since the whole purpose in that method of preaching is to look at the biblical text and understand what the biblical text is saying, let's just focus on the biblical text about baptism. (laughs) And it'll be easy, right? You see, whether we realize it or not, that whole system, that whole understanding that you would be saved by faith, repentance, and baptism is no different than the Galatian heresy, right? Right? Because the Judaizers came into the church in the region of Galatia. And they said, believe on Christ. But they said, you also have to be circumcised to be saved. It's the same thing. You're just trading baptism for circumcision. You're just trading one thing for another thing. You're just trading this for that. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul wants to make the very clear case that Only by faith in Christ plus nothing. Faith in Christ alone is what a person is saved by. And we sometimes think that we're done with Pharisees. 
and we're done with legalism. But when we judge church attendance or how many times a day you pray or how many times a day you read the Bible or any of these strict kind of things to validate a salvation, be careful. Be very careful. We're in trouble. We need to be free of legalism. Legalism is as dangerous as liberalism and it kills. It is not from God. Look at verse 10 and verse 11 as we close this morning. And notice what Paul does. Actually, the second part of verse 9 through verse 11. Remember, I I mentioned the clause when we were reading. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed... The Spirit of God lives in you. For if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now look at verse 10. It explains the verse we just read. Now if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit gives you life because of righteousness. And we close with verse 11. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through the Spirit who lives in you. I lived through the era where it was taught, it was preached, it was encouraged, and it was told, all you have to do to be saved is just walk down that aisle, repeat after me in this prayer that you don't even understand, and if you said those words, then don't ever question it, because you're questioning God. You are saved. I have argued with parents as they tell me that their child has never shown the fruits of salvation, but I know they're saved because they prayed that prayer. I was there on that Sunday when they did it. But there's no fruit. There's no spiritual life. There is unrepented sin. There is repetitive sin in their life. There is no passion for God. There's no passion for his word. There is no passion for spiritual life or spiritual things at all. And here in the text, I didn't say it, Paul said it. The Holy Spirit of God said it through Paul. He's saying if you don't have that, if you don't have Christ's spirit living in you, if there is not something in you that is drawing you to repent, drawing you to lead a repentive life, Drawing you to please God. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you claim. It doesn't matter what you prayed. You're not saved. That's what he's saying. It's exactly what he's saying here in the text. Now what does he reference in verse 10? As he says, now if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. Talking about the old man, right? Dying. But the spirit gives life because of righteousness and then in verse 11 and if the spirit of him who raised jesus from the dead lives in you then he who raised christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through the spirit who lives in you he's referencing romans chapter 6 he's referencing that chapter he's referencing that text where he so eloquently talked about the old man dying. Sin didn't reign in the mortal, sin couldn't reign in the mortal body and him be living spiritually. The old man dies. The old man is dead. And through the spirit of life, the new man is risen. We talk a lot about baptism, but listen to me. Water baptism is a symbol of salvation. All right? It doesn't save anybody. And here's the deal. It's a symbol of the old man dying. And it's a symbol of when the person comes up out of the water, 
He's been immersed, and he comes up out of the water, the new man emerging to spiritual life. So this morning, the question is, are you justified by faith in Christ? Where you have understood that number one, you're a sinner. Number two, you're hopelessly lost. You can't save yourself. Number three, you have asked Jesus to come into your life. You've believed on him. You've asked him to come into your life to save you. And you've become a follower of Christ. And you've seen that evidence in your own life where you're drawn to repent of sin, drawn to turn away from sin, drawn to live your life to please God, drawn to the Word of God, and you have a love for the Word of God and a love for the worship and a love for the people of God. Has that happened in your life? Or has it been just a prayer that was prayed? You've heard me reference it so many times. I'll say it one more time, and then I promise we're going to pray. I'm giving you the broken promise four or five times here now. Many of you, many of you thought you were saved. You banked on that. And had you had died before the Bailey Smith crusade, you'd be in hell right now because you thought you were saved. But you weren't because after that crusade, many of you gave your life to Christ. Some of you have personally talked to and said, I knew I wasn't saved. I knew something wasn't right with me. I knew I didn't have a passion for God. I ask you this morning, where are you at with the Lord? If you were to die right now, would heaven be your home? Have you been reconciled to God? Does your life right now speak to Christ, speak to spiritual things? Is there a passion in you to want to obey the scriptures and to want to live to the glory of God? Is reconciliation your truth this morning with God? Or is it just a traditional element of coming to a building and hearing some music and hearing a message delivered from the Bible? Our whole eternity is based on it. I ask you this morning, what has God been saying to you through the music, through the message today, and how will you respond to God? Ms. Becca? Please, and we'll sing our invitational hymn, Whiter Than Snow. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee. been to gather as a church family this morning and to worship our Savior who through his work on the cross has justified us who have believed on him. 
I pray that you'll come back tonight as we continue to look at the Gospel of Mark. And let us leave this building knowing that the message of Christ dwells in us. We're responsible to go and to share Jesus with this lost world. 